My name is Sophia and I'm a junior consultant at Turner and Townsend. We're joined today by Nathan Good, who's the Chief Strategy Officer, Officer at the Social Value Portal. This is a retrofit information support and expertise, so RISE event, which is fully funded by the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero, delivered by Turner and Townsend. I will now hand over to Nathan to start today's pre presentation. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Sophia, and thank you very much to all of you that have joined us this afternoon for inviting me here and um, giving your time for this session. So just before I dive in, I'd like to just say a little bit more about myself and Social Value Portal and kind of where where I'm coming from, if you like, on this particular subject, which is which is dear to my heart. So I've been working with Social Value Portal for nearly nine years now, and the reason I joined SVP in the first place was actually having previously been working in the energy and renewables sector with a large accounting firm in their advisory team. And I'd kind of come to the view that um, the the sector, the decarbonisation sector, if you want to call it that, was missing the point to some extent on the social dimension to the transition that everybody was working so hard to achieve through their decarbonisation strategies. And it seemed to me that Social Value Portal offered the opportunity to to start to develop some thinking about how that social dimension could be factored into the planning and the strategy for the really critical work that that everybody in the sector is doing to 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 help our environment and save the planet and and save save humanity ultimately so this this is a really interesting conversation to be having from my point of view because it brings those two things together the environmental side of things the decarbonization side of things with with the social piece as well the other thing i just wanted to say before diving in was we we have a lot of data at Social Value Portal. Uh, among other things, what we do is we manage a platform for procuring for social value. So tenders, public sector tenders that are issued and the the system of social value that we use called the TOM system is used to set targets for bidders. Uh, bidders set their own targets in the platform and then they come back and report against delivery of those targets. And the tenders are a whole wide range of stuff. Anything that the that, that public sector, local authorities in particular, tender for. It includes uh, refurbishment projects, and some of those refurbishment projects, I think, are in effect retrofit projects. So just to say that I'm going to start wide in terms of looking at the, the kind of broad case for social value in business and contractual activity, um, then go more into the construction and real estate sector and then talk about our experience with refurbishment. We don't actually have a separate data set at the moment on retrofit itself, but I think a lot of the lessons that we're learning in terms of the type of projects that work and the way social value can be applied to them is, is applicable to retrofit. But I'm really keen at the end of this session to have a bit more of an open debate because those of you who are attending will have, I'm sure, more experience than I do in the specific delivery of retrofit projects. And I'd love to hear from you about how we collectively, those of us that are involved in social value, actually can calibrate what we do more effectively to meet the needs that you're you're seeing um, out there in, in when you're when you're having to deliver these projects. So I will move on. A lot of these presentations start off by defining social value if you like. I'm going to do it again. So a little apology for doing that, but but I think it's worth starting from first principles just to say, so that we're clear in our understanding of what we're trying to do. Really then ask the question about whether this is a compliance thing, you know, whether this is just another thing that people have to do to tick the box or whether there is more to it than, than that. But then talk about the data that we're getting and the, and the spread of social value, if you like, that we've seen over, over the last few years and how that then relates to the construction and real estate sectors and the specific issues we're seeing with refurbishment projects, the opportunities that they create and also the problems that they have as well, which I think a lot of which will be applicable to, to retrofit and then sort of offer some potential approaches that might might help, but very much kind of throw it open to the floor at that point to see what all of you think as well. So 
what is social value? It's it's a and I, and I think there's a consensus on this now, and we've spent a lot of time debating it. I guess over the years, it it is a broadly based approach to looking at the additional benefits that a a, a kind of an activity, a business activity, a commercial activity, a project, a business can do that goes beyond their core financial purpose of financial sustainability purpose, if you like. Uh, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, have done a really good job, I think, in anchoring that broad concept. They don't call it social value, but it, it kind of doesn't matter. There are lots of different words for this. We call it social value in the UK in procurement. Other people call it social sustainability. It's about that added value that you're generating that is is goes beyond your your core business purpose and is about the wider effects that you have on the communities that you work with on the planet on society and very much there are, there are these multiple dimensions to it it's about creating additional economic benefit it's about supporting communities it's about supporting the transition and the drive towards more environmental sustainability so is it just another compliance thing compliance is a good thing a regulation is a good thing it standardizes approaches it sets a baseline it it gives people a set of rules within which to work and compliance in and around social factors as well as environmental factors is increasingly a feature of the the, the world that, that that we all work in today social value i think goes beyond that basic compliance piece although that's really important but it's about building on that and going beyond that the UK government has reinforced its commitment to social value through the procurement act it's opened up the opportunities for delivering public benefit through social value in 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 the act and adding to and extending the the spirit if you like of the the original social value act back in 2012 which very much kicked this whole thing off in in the UK i think the really interesting thing actually about the the way in which it, the UK government the previous government but i think the current government will will certainly not row back from this it'll build on it what the previous government thought about the need for disclosure and that i think ties back into the compliance question which as i say is just as important as doing the additionality piece but increasingly what we will see is generally in procurement in the uk a need to disclose more about the way in which processes take place and there's there's obviously some relatively recent experience with procurement in COVID, for example, which underpin the public desire to see more transparency and more disclosure about the way in which the public pound is being spent. Um, that's really important for social value. It's really important that the, the aspirations and the targets and the vision that are set for social value delivery at the beginning of a particular process are actually followed through and delivered and visibly delivered and signed off by somebody. That's very much something at Social Value Portal that we 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 welcome i think it also means that we will progressively move towards more of a standard for social value which at the moment i think is is somewhat missing social value portal has a way of measuring social value but there are various other ways of doing it out in the market as well it makes it much more difficult for buying authorities and suppliers to actually know how to compare different approaches if the underlying methodologies are also different. So I think the drive towards greater transparency will just support that progression towards creating a standard and underpinning the uh, delivery of social value. At the same time, we're getting market convergence. So the private sector is coming to this from a separate route, but the end result is 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 converging. And by that I mean that the 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 environmental sustainability progression that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years is now being reinforced by a social approach as well. We've had the UN Sustainable Development Goals obviously since 2015, but now the other mechanisms for assessing whether a business is doing the right thing, if I can put it that way, are catching up as well. So the European CSRD is is really starting to come into play through the, the uh, sustainable reporting standards. The other thing I wanted to call out on this slide was GRESB, uh, which is the global, global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. 
and increasingly this is a it's a very extensively used standard of certification that is used in the real estate sector and the increasing focus within GRESB is on the social components as well as the environmental components and Social Value Portal actually has a tool that is certified by GRESB to contribute to that social side of reporting as well as simply disclosing, for example, carbon efficiency or energy efficiency within a building. So GRESB is very much moving towards that combined social and environmental assessment. CSRD is doing the same. Um, UN Sustainable Development Goals are, are, are very much a kind of comprehensive view which combines environmental and social. So that supports the move towards a greater integration of social value in, in our approach. And then some of you might recognize this. This is the this is the donut from Donut Economics, which is a, a great book. If if some of you haven't read it, please read it um, by Kate Rayworth that was published back in 2017. But in this book, she designed her view of the donut. And essentially what the donut is, it's an outer ceiling from an ecological perspective, which we need to make sure we don't overshoot. And clearly retrofit projects designed very much to to support that that outcome and staying within that ecological ceiling but critically the social foundation is important as well so we have to be in the space between those two lines which in effect gives it a the shape of a donut so that's that's a kind of i think although people may not talk about it in these in these terms increasingly there's an acceptance that this social and environmental combination is really important to 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 combine so just moving to some of the data what we have seen over the last few years is is an increasing amount of social value delivery and what you're seeing here on the chart is the percentage of social value relative to the contract value so back in 2016 when we really didn't know too much about how this was going to play out we guessed that you might get around about a 20% uplift in in valuation terms against the contract value that was accountable by social value. And weirdly, actually, it's turning out to be broadly right, although there's a very wide range, as you can see. At the top end, you'll get some people are, are delivering plus 45% social value relative to the contract value. And that's where there's a very heavy focus on local supply chains and local employment. And in other cases, it's it's relatively low. And it's not to say that any one of these is necessarily good or bad because it varies very much according to the kind of contract, the size of contract, the sector in which the contract is being delivered. And it's really just understanding what, how we use this to benchmark our expectations of social value delivery. But fundamentally, what it does do is tell you that you can deliver that added value through procurement, through setting targets against a, a, a contract value. The other thing that's quite interesting is that from the work we do, we see that uh, bidders for contracts tend to get, if they do well in their qualitative submission, so ignoring the targets they set for social value, they tend to, to be more likely to actually win the contract itself. So there's a correlation between the quality of the overall bid and the quality of the social value bid. It's just some data on how that, that distributes across the UK. The black percentages in the middle of the slide are the percentage value add, contract value add. And on the right hand side, you're seeing the year on year change in, in, in that value. Interesting, the distribution, this is only social value portal data, by the way. So the, the 1 billion odds that you see in the bottom right hand corner is, is just social value portals data. So we expect that the actual figure for real estate construction social value in 2022 must be significantly higher than that because we don't clearly hold all the data. It's just a snapshot. So this is a big thing overall. Good to see this in terms of the life cycle of a building. 
And in principle, you can design social value in at the beginning. You can create the conditions for social value. You can even measure some of the, the design effects of that social value delivery. Construction is probably the, the, the most familiar area that, that people see in terms of social value and where social value has been most readily adopted because you do start with a more or less a kind of a clean site and you can think about you have a contract of a, a reasonable length that you can then think about in terms of how you bring those social value components in over a period of time. But what's really interesting is the potential for social value while the building is fully operational and clearly refurbishment and retrofit come into that space. So the actual potential social value deliverable through the operational phase of the building it dwarfs the social values that you get in planning or in construction. So it's a massive opportunity but it's actually quite hard sometimes to, to, to capture, to access that opportunity. So there's a little bit of a perception out there at the moment, I think, sometimes that there are lots of big promises being made about social value, you know, in order to win tenders, for example, but they're not really being followed through. And I think it's certainly true to say that the quality of contract management of social value commitments is variable. And it's also challenging, I think, for buyers who are resource constrained are really struggling to to actually do the day job let alone add something on top of that in terms of social value delivery and that's that's probably a conversation for another time but in practice what we're seeing is that despite those perceptions there is a lot of good social value delivery going on and what this chart tells you is that for the data we hold generally speaking companies are over delivering on the commitments that they make. So in other words, the real social value that they actually deliver once they're awarded the contract is greater than they promised in the first place, which is the right way around. Um, you want to under promise and over deliver. But even more interestingly, actually, the companies that are doing contracts of between five and 10 million, who tend to be more likely to be SMEs, sorry, between the turnover figure is their own turnover, not, not the contract turnover. So these are relatively small contracts. They're actually ahead of, of some of the other categories. So the there's a perception maybe that small projects can't deliver social value. The data seems to tell us the opposite. Here is some data on what kind of social value is actually being delivered in practice. And I think this is interesting and relevant for, for, for consideration with people doing retrofit projects. The, the largest components are local jobs and supply chain spend, which I would have thought they, there's significant opportunity for retrofit, although the kind of retrofit will clearly have a big impact on that. If you're installing solar panels, there might be less opportunity for local labour and local uh, businesses to participate than would otherwise be the case, followed by involvement in the local area through donations, school visits and so on, and then apprenticeships are, are the big ones. So that's that, 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 that's sort of settling into, into a kind of pattern which is is i think worth focusing on i think it's very much a case of doing what you do best or what you you can do most effectively and not trying to reach for the stars or do something that is is way outside your comfort zone as a company um, and that in itself delivers good value so the opportunities that we're seeing in terms of refurbishment projects and question the read across to retrofit but i think i think a lot of these these are relevant uh, you will get different trades that i'm sure depends very much on the nature of the retrofit project um, you've got main contractors who can actually proactively go and coordinate their supply chain and upskill their supply chain as well. And we're seeing a lot of good work in terms of upskilling tier ones, helping SMEs to win more work uh, by helping them work, work with, with social value requirements and make sure it doesn't become a burden to them. It actually becomes a positive factor in, in the way they, way they operate and something that's transferable from contract to contract. Public buyers particularly value local social values. So if you're able to get local labor force onto your contract, that that's a big deal. And it's a really important dimension for, for local authorities. 
generally construction refurbishment is very used to the concept of social value now so the the level of awareness and engagement i think goes all the way through the industry and and although there are particular challenges for smes in in some cases or and or micro businesses the the, under, the 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 willingness to engage in the understanding is very much there, and the capacity to li- deliver is also, I think, ahead of many other sectors in the economy. But lastly, I think the you know the contract management piece is following through and it's being able to show that this is actually delivering on the ground and providing the evidence for social value. So some of the problems, clearly you're not starting with a clean sheet of paper. If you're doing a retrofit or a refurbishment project, you have a clearly defined scope. So that immediately places limitations on to how you can innovate in some in terms of something like social value. Refurbishment contracts, and I'm sure this is also true for retrofit, are often relatively short term. You know, apprenticeships, for example, become a problem. They might be high volume, there might be a lot of them, but actually, in, you know, they're low value as individual contracts, and they're probably done on relatively tight margins, particularly if if um, you're you're doing an installation program. It's perceived to be unfair on smaller suppliers because it does potentially, if you're not careful, place that extra kind of bureaucratic requirement in the tender process, which they can ill afford to deal with. Um, There's a lack of consistency in the buying community about what they're asking for. There's often very limited engagement with suppliers because they're small contracts. So that opportunity to to, to kind of reorientate the perspective so so that suppliers can think about it in a more creative way is sometimes lost. And clearly with retrofit, for example, you're, you, you might be arguing that, well, you know, we're doing our bit because, because we're solving the problem of decarbonisation. So those are, there are quite a few challenges there that we need to think about. I think what would be interesting to then talk about is, is how do we shift away from just identifying the problems to, to beginning to find different ways of working. So what we're increasingly seeing is local authorities, for example, wanting to move away from a transactionally based social value approach. Um, so thinking about it at a, at a different level. So it's not, not about saying, put a set of requirements on each individual contract. But if you're running a framework, for example, set the um, the social value requirements at the framework level, or consider it in terms of the flow of work that's coming through and likely to come through over a period of time, and set the requirements in a way that that allow people to be flexible in 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 what they can they can deliver. Actually, being really clear and definitive from a buyer end in terms of what you're looking for and tailoring that to suit the the context and the supply chain is is hugely valuable because it takes out a whole layer of uncertainty and investment time for for the for for the companies that are looking to bid for those projects and and collectively you know potentially for larger refurbishment projects you can actually design in the requirements with, by working with working with the market to to scope that out effectively and i think it doesn't help anybody not to have an effective contract management solution. And so if you know as a supplier that you are going to be engaged in important discussions about the social value delivery alongside meeting the milestones, that's going to make a big difference to the way in which you approach it. If you know, if you suspect that that you're doing all this stuff and nobody else is, is actually being held to account for it, it's going to demotivate you at the same time. So... I think we have the opportunity to move to a much more standardized approach as well and be more transparent back to the procurement act and you know achieve better comparability which is going to work for everybody all around.